My name is Asal Habibi. I'm an assistant research professor of psychology at the Brain and Creativity Institute at the University of Southern California. My training and background is in neuroscience and in psychology. I'm generally interested to better understand human behavior and learn about the brain. Um, I use a variety of methods and techniques like magnetic resonance imaging, MRI, and electroencephalography and behavioral assessments to better learn and understand uh, underlying brain circuits uh, of human behavior. One of the research programs of my lab that we've been focusing on the past few years is understanding the relationship between music and the brain and how learning music can make changes, neuroplastic changes in the underlying systems of the brain and how does it help with enhancing skills such as um, cognitive development, social development, and emotional development. We unfortunately live in a world that children are um, faced with many stresses. We know that, the stresses like war and uh, climate change and violence uh, and the current pandemic, obviously. And uh, of course, we do have to all work together collectively to reduce and um, uh, to work to solve and resolve some of these problems. but. Another thing that we could do is to give children a toolbox to respond to these stresses better, to have more resiliency towards uh, in face of these uh, circumstances. And I think that music is one of these tools that can help children regulate their emotion, their mood, and to respond better in stressful circumstances. So that's kind of the work that I presented partly at the Scottish Parliament last time I was there. I talked about a study that we have been doing since 2012 at the Brain and Creativity Institute at USC um, with, in collaboration with the Los Angeles Philharmonic and their youth orchestra program, YOLA. And this study was uh, really manifested from the idea that despite the fact that we have about two decades or so of evidence of the importance of music training for children and adults, there is still this decline of music education programs around the world and, and specifically for us in California and in the States. So we wanted to put our efforts together to specifically look at children as they are growing up, as they're developing, how does music training systematically affect their development. Uh, we recruited a group of children from underserved communities that YOLA serves. And uh, we basically have been um, following and tracking them since they were six years old. The study right now is in its seventh year. Um, and we have been comparing them with another group of children who are not receiving music training. They all come from very similar socioeconomic and cultural backgrounds. And what we did at the beginning of the study, prior to any training, we matched the two groups. We basically measured their abilities, um, their language, attention, um, cognitive abilities. We also looked at their brains and we also looked at their social and emotional abilities. And we reported that at the onset, prior to having any training, there was no systematic differences between the groups. That gave us a baseline to start. We know that at that age, at six years old, the two groups were equal going into this. Since then, we have been seeing these children about uh, once a year. They come to our laboratory at the Brain and Creativity Institute. And we measure through um, psychometric measures. Uh, we look at the really different skills that we are interested to, to see if better it's impacted by music training or not. So for example, we look at their mathematical abilities. We look at their academic achievement. We look at their basic auditory memory, cognitive functions, executive functions. We also um, use our uh, modern neuroimaging techniques, um, such as MRI. We put the children inside an MRI scanner and capture an image of their brain while they're doing different tasks. That is allowing us to better understand how their different brain systems are involved uh, in accomplishing a task while they're in the scanner. And we also do interviews with their parents because not only we are interested to see how an individual is impacted and influenced by music training, but how does this training impact the family and also ultimately the community. So we have really a very, very large and rich data set from these children. The study was um, planned for five years, but we were fortunate with the support of the National Endowment of the Arts to continue the study. Currently is it, it's in seventh year. Um, when I was at the 
uh, Scottish Parliament two years ago, I shared some of our preliminary findings from that study. It takes time as these kids get um, older. What we have observed is that not only children got better with their musical skills, but we observed differences in abilities that are not directly related to music. So for example, we observed that the auditory systems of their brain uh, are maturing faster. And these systems of the brain um, that are involved in auditory perception, although they are important for music and they are stimulated by music, um, but they're also important for any other skill that involves sound. So for example, language, communication. We have continued seeing these children who are uh, now adolescents. Uh, they started when they were six and now they're about 12 to 13 years old. Um, they continue to come to our laboratory. We have been extremely fortunate um, to have a very um, strong retention rate. We started with 75 children and um, at the end of the seventh year, I'd say we still have about 50 or 60 of them in, in, in the study, which is, uh, which is really a strong rate, especially because we are working with an underserved population. Uh, this is a population that is, um, tend to move a lot, tend to not be very stable, but we are very grateful for these parents and families to commit to this study and continue coming back. The very first systems of the brain that started to change were those auditory systems that I talked about earlier. But as time went by, we began to see changes in what we call far transfer effect. So not skills that are changing, that are not directly uh, practiced during music training. What uh, a set of skills that we call executive function. Executive functions are skills um, such as working memory, task switching, inhibition, that have been shown to be very important, not only for everyday success, but also they're actually very good predictors of uh, future success, well-being, health, even academic success in the future. So one of these skills, for example, that we have um, been exploring is the ability to control impulses, what we call delayed gratification. So for example, uh, waiting for a better reward in future, letting go of an immediate reward right now for a better or larger reward in future. And we have observed that children who have had music training are better in this task. They are more willing to wait for a better reward at a later time than wanting to have a smaller immediate reward right now. Uh, this is really a, a, a skill that when you go to learn music, you don't, you don't necessarily practice that, but it's really coming as part of that discipline of having to sit and play measure by measure and work with others. And not only we see that behaviorally, when we put these children in the MRI scanner and we give them an executive function task, children who have had music training, we see more engagement of these um, prefrontal regions of the brain that are involved in decision making and and planning uh, that these regions are, are, are more involved and strongly activated during these tasks compared to the children who did not have any music training. In terms of uh, giving feedback, getting feedback from their parents, so as I said, we interview the families um, to better understand uh, how the music training is impacting the family unit as a whole. And although all the parents at the beginning, both the music group and non-music group, sort of rated their children um, equally in terms of their behavior as time went by and children were involved in the YOLA program, we observed that parents of children who have had music training tend to say that their children are less aggressive, less hyperactive, and they're more compassionate. They want to make friendship with their siblings, with their friends. So it's easier to have them around both from a social and emotional perspective. Playing music for a child is a complex task. They have to learn, they have to read these abstract symbols and they have to translate them into meaningful sound. They have to adjust their finger movements, uh, really very fine finger movements to, to make the sound correct. They have to interact with others if they're in a youth group or even in any type of an ensemble. Um, they have to be able to read emotions of others and communicate in an emotional way. And all of this takes a lot of discipline, takes a lot of patience, and takes a lot of practice. Uh, and music is fun. I mean, it's, it's, it's something that it's been fun and pleasurable through human evolution. We've had it with us. Uh, but not only it's fun and it provides a activity for children, but our data and, and our findings really show that not only it supports uh, to have this extracurricular fun time, but it supports basic cognitive and executive function skills that are important 
uh, for well-being and academic success. So for example, what I talked about in terms of that delayed gratification, if it can be translated into more important decisions as these kids are trans, um, transitioning between childhood to early adolescence, decisions become more important. Decisions are not going to be about quarters and candies at the lab. Decisions are about to be choosing peer groups, uh, saying no to drugs, showing up to class. And if these skills are practiced, that's the same impulse control is practiced and the same underlying brain systems support uh, delaying that immediate gratification, they would be able to implement that same skill in decisions that are more important and more necessary and are more consequential for their life. Another, for example, thing that we have been seeing is that children in our group who have had music training show uh, score better on empathy tasks. So they show more empathy, which is being able to really understand another person's an emotion and also share that emotion. So that is a huge skill that we hope all of our children have by the time they make it to high school, by the time they're adolescents and go to college, so they can successfully interact with others. It's a very comprehensive toolbox uh, that is supporting these kids, both in terms of their cognitive development, their place in the world, their relationship with their families, and also emotional and um, social development. And then uh, it's great that we have the evidence of the brain underlying, underlying brain mechanisms changing to support these behavior. I do think that our results are generally true for different forms of art, given uh, whether it's dance, whether it's visual arts, obviously the specifics would be different. So for example, um, the sensory motor integration, the relationship between sensory cortex and motor cortex that we see this coupling that happens in music, it happens in dance as well. Um, so we would be able to see very similar um, changes in the brain. Dance could have a, uh, other impact on the brain or on social behavior that we don't see in music. But I think generally these larger and broader executive function skills, uh, ability to delay gratification, ability to hold something in your auditory working memory, um, ability to have discipline to just kind of commit to something and step by step making it going forward um, is true for all forms of arts. And, and the common thing between them is that I think it's important that I don't want to promote arts because it's good for school achievement. Uh, arts have their own right to, to be important and significant, but it's a plus. I think that's what we need to recognize that, that not only it provides some really pleasurable and fun time for children and they actually enjoy it, but it has these benefits, these secondary benefits that are hugely important. And what are the things that we really all strive at school to teach kids to have executive function, to be able to have impulse control, to be able to connect with others better uh, through empathy and compassion. I know that many, many schools around the world face budget cuts. For example, just in California in the last decade when we had increase in children's population, student population at school about 6%, one of the items in the curricula that really got a very sharp cut was music. Uh, music uh, education declined by about 50%. So the number of students to music teacher just increased. And, and it's, it's understandable that when um, school administrators are faced with these very sharp budget cuts and there's this emphasis on STEM uh, and science education, science and math, and I am not by any means saying that we should take budget off science. Uh, I'm a scientist by training, but I think it's really important to have this insight that from everything I said, there needs to be investment in music and art education. And we cannot just leave it to the, to the school administrator to just leave it or have it. If you have time, just add it. It has, there has to be policies uh, and, and resources available to bring back art education, and especially in the current times. I'm, I'm very much aware of the economic uh, circumstances and limitation of resources, but this is the time to bring music and art back to children's life, uh, have that available to them, because not only it's good for their development in terms of their cognitive skills, their executive function skills, the skills that we want them to develop, but also it's hugely giving them a, a tool to respond to the current stress.